lately frustrating years with my nose pressed up against the window. If I always just used to joke that if you wanted to send a letter to me, address it Quentin Tarantino on the outskirts of the industry. Trust me, I'd have got it. A friend of mine, Sheldon Ledich, had mentioned that there was this guy, Quentin Tarantino, working at Imperial Pictures. I guess he was stuffing video boxes in the and videos in the video boxes, that is, and um, <laughs> uh, Sheldon said, yeah, this guy really knows your work, he knows the movies you've done, and, you know, I also wrote, uh, co-wrote Evil Dead 2, and, uh, and so on, and so um, Sheldon says, yeah, Quentin would really like to meet you. So I met Quentin, and um, he seemed like this, you know, exuberant uh, movie fanatic who had written a script. At that time, it was Natural Born Killers. When I read Natural Born Killers, that was the first thing I read of Quentin's, and I read True Romance, and, and, um, and of course, Reservoir Dogs, but I went, why isn't this guy, why isn't, why isn't this film already been made? Because you have to understand, Quentin was so broke that he didn't have a car, he didn't have anything. That's why he would be crashing, he crashed on my couch all the time. <laughs> really broke, just not, not a cent to his name. It was really great to see him like, get his first writing gig. Because making money for him any other way, that was fine. That was just the way to, but to, to make money, to get paid for what you really love to do, that was, I think, really, really me meant a lot to him. And it was just great to see that. It was just like. Scotty knew Lawrence Bender. And amazingly enough, the first film that K&B ever did was called Intruder. Scott directed it, and Lawrence Bender produced it. So that was uh, February of 1988. I made this film with Scott, and uh, it was a little while after that. It went really well. It's called Intruder, and uh, and Scott was friends with Quentin, and um, Quentin was this buddy of Scott's who was a really talented guy, uh, had a script, and. Um, you know, he, he needed me to produce it. I actually produced a low-budget movie. I met Lawrence Bender at a party. A party uh, for a friend of mine, a friend of Lawrence's. Lawrence had just done his first movie. It was a $100,000 slasher movie called The Intruder for Empire, Charlie Band's old company. The cheapest movie Empire ever made, which is saying one hell of a lot. <laughs> I, one, I really liked The Intruder. I thought it was like the Coen brothers that made a slasher film, all right? Um, and I've always been a big fan of the slasher film genre. Um, and I'd never met a real producer in my life. Not one who would talk to me anyway. So he said, I'm gonna make him write this script called Reservoir Dogs. It all takes place in the garage. And he explained this whole thing to me. And, um, and he said, we can make it for like $50,000. And uh, he had just sold True Man, so he could have a little money from that. Not a lot. And, uh, and I was going to see if I could raise any more money. We could shoot on 16 millimeter and the whole thing. And he wrote the script in three and a half weeks, literally. And uh, I went to his house, drove up to his house. He didn't have a car. And, um, and he was, he was handpicking them out on his typewriter. And I was reading them. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is really amazing. And I got my, like, really excited. And I said, uh, listen, give me some time. Let me, I could raise some real money for this. And he said, no fucking way. And Lawrence basically said, hey, I can get you the cash for this. And Quentin put the caveat. It's like, all right, you got X amount of time. <laughs> you know, it sounds like a movie plot in of itself. You've got X amount of time to get the dough. Otherwise, I, I got to go elsewhere. We signed like a piece of paper that we hand wrote out. And um, that's basically how it all began. waiting for somebody to tap me on the shoulder all through Reservoir Dogs, say, what the fuck are you doing here? Get out of here. <laughs> and Lawrence was the one saying, calm down. They're not going to fire you. You're OK. I've got your back. Hooking Quentin and, 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 and Lawrence up in that sense, because it just reminded me of myself and Lawrence in that same situation just a year or two earlier. Mm -hmm. And so you're both really hungry. You both want to make the best movie you can. And, and it's weird, and, and you go and do it. It's just like, wow, it's like, cool, all right. It's 
kind of surreal. I mean, it's great. And everybody just wishes that they could even have a little piece of that, you know, of, of any kind. But to do what you love and then to have people embrace you for it and want to give you awards and lots of money and everything else, it's just, it's kind of, kind of cool. And after hitting the pavement for Quentin for years and years and just people going, get out, get lost, beat it, get out of here, your script sucks. Mm -hmm. It's especially, I think, gratifying, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, that's ultra, just so cool. <laughs> I think my first um, encounter with Quentin happened during Reservoir Dogs. Um, I was still um, in New York, and I went to a casting call on a Sunday for this film, and I read it. It was just such an amazing script to listen to these guys talk and realize these were like guys talking about everyday stuff who had a kind of very unique outlook on life. Um, that was pretty um, intense stuff. And I went to the audition and naturally didn't get the job. And uh, my next encounter with Quentin was at Sundance when uh, I saw Reservoir Dogs. And I was just so excited watching that film. And after the film, he came up to me and asked me, well, how'd you like the guy who, who, who uh, got your part? I was like, oh. <laughs> I, I'm interested in playing any part that Quentin writes, really, and uh, and that was a, when we when we worked together last. That was um, everybody's feeling. All the actors that were on Reservoir Dogs, we will come in for, and do a line if he wants us to, or we'll come in and play a, a big part. Doesn't matter, but if he wants us, we'll be there. I knew from the very beginning that the film was going to be a huge smash. I just smash head. I knew when I read the script, I knew when the actors were going to, the actors who were getting involved, I knew from meeting Quentin that it was going to be something really special. I remember going to a party when I was in the middle of cutting Reservoir Dogs, and I had all these images in my head from Reservoir Dogs. I mean, these, but they were such incredible, wonderful images, even though they were violent. And I went to this very uptight party. And I was trying to explain to some people this film, and I just realized that I couldn't without them seeing it. All you have to remember, see, it's kind of like died down a little bit, but like at the time, my pro pers you know, my 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 you know profile in the industry or the way critics wrote about me or part of the thing that they always talked about me, all right, was violence, 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 violence. He's a violence guy and he likes violence, all right, so in movies, all right? And, and so uh, if, uh, uh, if you were gonna take a slab at me, it was like almost like I'm, I'm immoral for doing what I'm doing, all right? Like saying liking violence in movies is the same thing as liking violence in real life, all right? Yeah, which is not. Um, let's see, well, I met Quentin because he had um, liked some of my earlier work, and uh, he just wanted to meet me. I was kind of one of his favorite actors, and Brian De Palma was one of his favorite directors, and he kind of correlated us, I think. And um, what happened? He just wanted to meet. So we got together, and we met, and we had a good time, and said, gee, one day we'll do a project together. Little did I know it would be his next project because when he finished the script, he kind of, I think he was thinking of a different actor prior to it, and then suddenly he thought, you know, John might be really good for this. So he presented it to me, and I read it, and um, I thought it was one of the best scripts I'd ever read. Dark, but great. I've just been a, you know, John Troll's one of my favorite actors. I've just been a big, big fan of his for like a really long time. Uh, um, yeah, I, you know, I think he was great in Saturday Night Fever and uh, Urban Cowboy, and in particularly in Blowout. That's like one of my favorite performances of all time. And I just haven't seen him like uh, um, used in a movie the way you know I thought he should be used, you know, the way I would use him. And uh, um, and so like I wanted to meet him, and I met him, and I really liked him. And I was just like looking for looking forward to the opportunity of having the chance to work with him, you know, on the right thing. You know, there's a lot of people I want to work with, and it's just like, you know, when the time's right, it's right. 
and then I wrote Vincent and um, gave it for him to read. I didn't write it for him, I just wrote the character. And he dug it and he loved it and, and I loved the way he would have took with it. And so it was like, okay, great, this is excellent. We get, you know, right off the bat, we get to break the ice, you know, and, it's, and, and he's doing a, a terrific job. I felt that he was gonna probably have a lot of trouble getting me cast in it. As earnest as he was in wanting me to do it, there's a lot more kind of um, hot actors or contemporary actors that would fill the bill easier than I would. So I thought, you know, he might have a hard time getting me in this. But he stuck to his guns, and he really pushed for me to, uh, to be in this movie. And uh, I'm thankful he, he, he did. I've um, done two romance, uh, read Natural Born Killers, and audition for that. And uh, when I heard that he had me in mind when he wrote this part uh, for this film, I was too excited. So when I got the script, I read it immediately. And I couldn't believe what I read. So I immediately started it again to make sure, and I read it through twice, you know, to make sure. I was like, God, this is so amazing. On all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd. Uh, I met Quentin at Sundance three years ago. I think it was three years ago. I saw uh, Reservoir Dogs, and it really uh, screwed me up. It really blew my mind. And I went up to Quentin after this and said, oh my god, this is a really great film. And I met him there, and then I... I, oh, he produced a film that I was in called Killing Zoe, which hasn't come out yet. And then he just acted in a film that I produced called Sleep With Me, which hasn't come out yet. And then uh, he called me up for this. I was like every other actor in, in Hollywood came and auditioned and I actually auditioned for the part of Mia everybody did and and, uh, and then uh, it was my birthday and Quentin called me up and they asked me if I would play the part of Jody and I said yeah great sure this film never addresses violence in a mean-spirited fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always uh, something that's an outgrowth of the event, or it's something that's totally accidental that people acknowledge for a very brief moment and then they move on to something else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not those odes to violence that Clinton sometimes has been accused of writing. September 23rd, 1994, the opening night of the New York Film Festival. It's your movie. It's playing. The shot where she gets hit in the heart for, with the adrenaline shot. Yeah. Someone passes out, is having a seizure. Mm -hmm. What did you think? This movie fucking works. <laughs> it's like, shit, this shit's like too intense for human beings. <laughs> it's like, Hey, that can stop people's heart, man. Uh, that's, 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 that's cinema. Harvey, myself, and the doctor, you know, helped this guy as he revived, and we helped him outside, outdoors, and he had a little bit of a sugar low or something, and I guess that just kind of pushed him over the top, so someone gave him some orange juice or something, I forgot what it was, Coca-Cola, and he was okay. And, but uh, uh, actually, it was like, whoa, this is, this is, this is, this is a movie. <laughs> That's what I've been sitting here contemplating. First, I'm gonna deliver this case to Marcellus. Then, basically, I'm just gonna walk the earth. What you mean, walk the earth? You know, like Kane in Kung Fu. He has a great facility for writing uh, natural dialogue. Um, even though these people are killers or, um, mm, I guess, misfits in society in a certain kind of way, they have real, um, 
conversational things going on in their lives, like normal guys or you know just normal people, and that's 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 just so unique. The great thing I think about Quentin's writing is that it all seems real. It's like the words just come out like real people talking, which is a relief as an actor. It's it's a relief. He, he is a very, very talented writer. It's, I've been saying that he's like the modern Charles Dickens. And Dickens wrote about regular people. We've asked everybody this question. Um, we've asked everybody if they could take a stab at telling the story of the movie. Telling my, this story? Uh, no. No way. Absolutely not. No way. <laughs> sure, it is... The idea for all three stories was basically to take, um, like, the oldest chestnuts, you know, that you've you've ever seen, you know, of, uh, when it comes to crime stories. The oldest stories in the book, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Vincent Vega, Marcellus Wallace's wife. The oldest story about, like, you know, the big man's, you know, the guy's got to go out with the big man's wife and don't touch her. You know, you've seen the story a zillion times. The gold watch, the second story, you know, the boxer who was supposed to throw the fight and he doesn't. You've seen it a zillion times, all right? Um, and the third story is not so much a classic story, but almost a big cliche. Like every other Joel Silver movie starts off with a couple hitmen showing up at a place and, you know, shooting somebody and splitting. And, um, and then, like, you know, that's like the first five minutes of the movie, and then, like, they cut to Arnold Schwarzenegger somewhere else, you know, and then, like, you know, it's all gonna tie in, all right? In the third story, in this one, it's like these two hitmen. They go and they take care of this guy, and it, but like in, after they after they kill him, we don't leave. We hang out with them all morning long, and see what happens to them during the course of that morning. What Quentin finds so interesting, he said anyway to me at one point, is not, you know, it's not the scene where someone comes into a restaurant and blows someone's head off, you know? But his, his interest in all these crazy, totally, you know, hyper-real things that he writes about is how we all in life react to them in extremely normal ways. There are three stories that, that are really about one story, and it's very difficult to do that. It's very difficult to write something that is that complex and that complicated and still so, you know, simple of a story. And it's about this kind of uh, everyday common sense minutia meeting up against these extraordinary, amusing, or not necessarily unreal, but you know, hyper real, dramatic activities that are taking place, and it's it's the sort of the the textural fabric of the human amused kind of relationship to those larger than life events. I remember reading Reservoir Dogs, which was structured in a similar way, where you're real time and then flashbacks and then in Pulp Fiction he took it even a little further because there were three stories and those stories somehow always ended up intermingling. Um, if you give the audience the opportunity to use its brain, it will. I'm, I'm using old forms of storytelling and then purposely having them uh, uh, go run a ride. <laughs> you, I mean, you know what I mean, you know, uh, so it's like, a, a, so it, it actually even seems even wilder because, you know, you've seen these stories a zillion times before, but you've never seen them quite play out like this before, you know, and I think part of the, the, the trick is to take these movie characters, these genre characters and these genre situations and actually apply them to some of real life's rules and see how they unravel. <laughs> the different colors, the levels. It's very much, Shakespeare said, holding the mirror up to nature. That's pretty much what, what I feel his writing, and especially how my character is written, is like. It, it really is as if Quentin met Marsalis somewhere or, or saw this experience, this situation, and put it down on paper. Well, the film kind of like has like, um, basically like three leads in it. 
It's got Vincent, who's the lead of the first story, Butch, who's the lead of the second story, and Jules, who's the lead of the, he's really the lead of the third story. Oh, I'm sorry, did I break your concentration? And, and then like uh, there's different characters that come in and support them, like, like for instance, like uh, uh, you know, Vincent is kind of supporting Jules in the third story. And he's got a small little part in the, in, in the second story with Butch. And Butch has got a small part in Vincent's story. Looking at something, friend? Me and my friend, Palooka. You know, so they're like, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, trading back, you know, trading back and forth. But they're like the three paramount leads, you know. So like, they're the three leads, and then everybody else in it: uh, uh, the wolf, Harvey Cattell's character, uh, Mia Wallace, uh, Fabian. You know, they're uh, uh, like these special guest stars. They come running through this, uh, running through the show, and um, and then the other characters like Marcellus Wallace, who's like the big boss man, who's in all three stories. They're kind of like the bedrock characters that kind of take you through, you know, that tie all three stories together. Don't you hurt him! Nobody's gonna hurt anybody. We're all gonna be like three little Fonzies here. And what's Fonzie like? Come on, Yolanda. What's Fonzie like? Cool. What? Cool. Correct, Mundo. When Pumpkin and Honey Bunny come in, it's their movie. We don't know different. Yeah, and we don't know any different. You know, they, they come on like they're the stars of the movie, you know? And actually, it's been that way with all the different actors in the film. When I've been working with them, you know, you know, when we work with Tim and Amanda, it's like a full solid week of working with them, and it's like, you feel like it's their movie, you know? And then they leave, and you go, oh my God, where did they go? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's like, how can I make the movie without them now? <laughs> the other thing, which I didn't realize until we started making this movie, and someone said to me, you know, you're really lucky. Um, you know, all these actors, it's just so great. I mean, no one gives you any trouble. Everyone is completely there for you. And I said, well, you know, maybe it's not luck. And I realized, and I thought about what it was that we did, and, and I realized one of the things that we do is by having rehearsal, it's not like, okay, you make a deal with the agents, and the agents got to, with, the, the, with the actor, and the actor feels like he's getting screwed, and he walks on the set, and, you know, there's no relationship. Is that you, not only do the actors get to work out on the movie before you start shooting, but also, you know, you form... A family before you start shooting in. You the actors and Quentin and I, we, we go out to dinner, we get to know each other. So when you walk onto the set, you've already created a, a real working relationship and a friendship with everybody. <laughs> that was a great one. <laughs> so, Mr. Willis, let me ask you a question here. Is this the finest moment of your acting career, or what? This is the pinnacle. From here on in, it slides down the back side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you want to do one more? Yeah, let's do another one. Yeah. Right. Coming back to you. Uh, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce. Uh, give just a little bit more of a of a of a slow burn, if like. Just, okay. Uh, yeah. You just like it. blank, and then boom, action. It's almost like doing stage work. It's the closest thing that I've done to stage work, I think. Because everybody here, I think, feels the same way I do and, and really respects Quentin's writing to the point of not wanting to come in and say, well, we have to take this line out and change this, and why can't I say this now? There's a respect for the writing that I haven't seen since I worked in, you know, in New York on, on stage. The theatrical aspect of it for me is more so the rehearsals and how Quentin he speaks what I call actor language. And can't explain the whole thing, how we're going to do it, like, boom, hit the windshield, you know, on the ground there. You know, everybody's here because they love the script and want to work with Quentin, who's a great writer, and, you know, so it's fun. It's a great crew, everybody's into it. It's like summer camp or something. It's really nice. It's the way movies should be made. Well, he's, I think he's one of the best directors I've worked with. And he's um, very, very enthusiastic, and that infects everybody. Everybody gets uh, enthusiastic. And it's just fun. It's a circus, really. Well, that's, you know, what, what I've found is that the only way to, to feel like you have a chance of making a good film is by working with people who are better than you. And, you know, or, you know, people that are totally unique and different and special, directors and actors. Quentin's in that league that has no name, and, you know, it's above um, 
uh, naming, and therefore, if, once you put a name on something, you just use dismiss, because then everybody thinks they know it and they can dismiss, dismiss it. But um, that is, honestly, he's a very exciting director. Quentin is such a classic because he sort of, he, it's this iconic American pop uh, medley. I don't even know how many interests are filtering into Quentin's writing all the time and re-delivering us our burger <laughs> with this international twist. I, I, I don't know, I find that all Quentin's stuff is so fresh and so aggressive and so, so, so daring and um, threatening at the same time. He has more of a filmic um, uh, reserve in his mind than I've ever seen before. And he's, he's bold with movies. He's an aggressive filmmaker. He knows exactly what he wants to do, and he's not concerned about mixing styles. or He just knows film is his clay. <laughs> good watcher, good director, somebody that's in there with you, um, not in your head, not in your heart, I don't mind that either, but he's in the, he's in there with you, and he expects a great deal. That's great, that's great, now remember, I want just blank expressions, just blank, you guys are gawkers, gawk. Quentin is a very responsible filmmaker. I mean, it's quite amazing. I mean, um, Quentin does not want to go over budget. He does not want to uh, go over schedule. I mean, he's very proud of the fact that he makes his days and that he stays on budget. And it makes him happy. You know, there's some directors that don't feel good shit. And it's not even, I'm not even saying it's bad necessarily. I mean, it makes it hard on the people who bring up the money. But Quentin is one of, is a director who completely, I mean, he's so responsible. It's, he's almost too responsible. Matter of fact, it was like one location on this shoot that it was funny, um, Andre, the DP, came up to me and says, oh, it's, what's going on? It's like, you're the director and Quentin is the producer. Because he's Quentin saying, forget it, it's too much money. I don't want to do it. Well, you know, the thing is, I mean, the thing is, I'm getting it from the roof. That's what I'm getting. Once he starts tipping off that roof, I'm cutting it on the ground. All right, we got the roof clear twice, right? Yeah. Yes or no? Let's move on. Okay, coming around. It's not worth it. It's a fucking, it's a pickup shot. You know, it's one shot. Quentin really sets the tone. It's a crew of people that love making movies. Like, I don't want to leave the set. This is a total get it out of your system movie. Before we leave out of this, since we're so happy here, and let's just do one more just like that, because that was excellent. It is a movie that you, you, know, you, you should see again and again and again. I think it will live a long time. This is no, this is no fad writing. This is no, it makes them, this is no fly-by-night thing. <laughs>